This is a special edition of State of the State. My name is Richard August, and I will be your commentator as we take a look back over the last 12 years. First, some background. In 1991, during the credit union crisis in the first year of the administration of Governor Bruce Sundlin, four men, Don Gill, Joe Devine, Robert Plant, and John Carlevalli decided that a public forum in the television medium was needed to help keep 365,000 credit union depositors informed concerning the status of their accounts and the state action plans. They began taping State of the State at the PEG RI TV studio located in West Warwick in the Cox Television facility. The program was aired on public access television. The last surviving member of the four founders is John Carlevalli, who is today the executive producer and sometime host of State of the State, which is now produced at the PEG RI TV studios in Providence. John and I met as members of the Board of Governors of Operation Clean Government. Shortly after the Sandy Hook Elementary School tragedy, he invited me to come on the program to discuss the issue of gun control. I guess I did okay because he asked me if I wanted to become one of a rotating group of hosts. Eventually, I began to book guests also as a co-producer. Today, State of the State is broadcast over public access channels and podcast over YouTube, Vimeo, almost all social media platforms, and our own website, stateofthestateri.com. We attempt to be nonpartisan in our content and bring to Rhode Islanders other stories of human interest. Over the last 12 years, I have noticed a change in the po political environment in Rhode Island and nationally that I would like to discuss. 12 years ago, elected and appointed officials and candidates for political office from all parties, Democrat, Republican, moderate, progressive, cool moose, and independent would come on this program. In fact, during election season, candidates would call us asking to be interviewed. However, there's been a notice, noticeable shift in elected and appointed officials willing to come on this program. In spite of the fact that we continually invite those on the left, mostly Democrats, our invitations are declined or ignored. Worse, some guests increasingly express a willingness to appear and then decline at the last moment. We take this program on the second and fourth Mondays of each month. We try to line up guests for two one-half-hour programs. When one guest backs away a week or so before scheduled to appear, it is almost impossible to find a replacement on such short notice. Obviously, we cannot overbook like airlines do, knowing that some passengers will not show up. This is not to say that all who decline are Democrats. Congressman Seth Magaziner appeared as a candidate for general treasurer and Congress. His Republican opponent, Mayor Alan Fung, chose not to come on after accepting during his failed campaigns for governor and Congress. Democrats like House Speaker Joe Shikarchi and Representative Julie Casimiro and Camille Vella Wilkinson and former Democrat Senator Jim Sheehan have been guests. Then-candidate, now General Treasurer James Diosa has come on the program. On the other hand, Democrat Attorney General Peter Narona refused to debate Republican challenger, challenger uh, Chaz Kalenda at the last moment on the basis that I had made a campaign contribution to Mr. Kalenda. We have had lively debates, such as the program with now Secretary of State Greg Amore and Republican challenger Patrick Cordalesa. I had a meeting with a mental health professional in Providence who decried the epidemic of gender dysphoria sweeping our schools, particularly among 6th, 7th, and 8th grade girls. At the, another meeting with several medical doctors, we discussed the crisis in medical care in Rhode Island, particularly among family practitioners. 
None of them would come on this program on the air for fear of being ostracized by colleagues or retribution by medical insurers. This is unfortunate. When I moved to Rhode Island in 1974, the Navy was pulling out of Newport and Quonset Davisville. But there was a strong manufacturing presence at the time. Brown and Sharp, Lisona, eyewear names like Foster Grant, many jewelry companies led by Spidel, the nuclear valve manufacturer Best in Flow or BIF, chemical processing by American Herxt and General Electric, and home to one of the first conglomerates, Royal Littles, Textron. There were two regional banks, Fleet and Hospital Trust here. Now all have been gobbled up or disappeared overseas or moved out of state. The state's economy is increasingly dependent on hospitality industry and military contracts for submarines. This is not a really good mix. We do have a corporate president, presence in the form of CVS Healthmark and also Amica Insurance. The population of the state hovers around 1 million souls plus maybe another 100,000 undocumented persons. If former Governor Gina Raimondo wasn't head of the Federal Department of Commerce in the last census, Rhode Island likely would have lost one of its two seats in the House of Representatives. We have become a one-party, solid blue state. Towns like North Kingstown, where I live, were once purple towns. The town council and school committee, committee majorities shifted back and forth from election to election. We had two Republicans representing the town in the legislature at the same time. No more. All elected positions are filled by Democrats, and the Rhode Island GOP has to scramble to find candidates who can finance their campaigns for governor, other general offices, and Congress. The last Republican general officer was Governor Don Kachiri. Rhode Island has become a state of dependency, with over half the residents receiving some form of state assistance or as an employee of the state or a municipality. Progressive claims their fund programs can be funded by taxing the rich without ever defining who the rich are. Our national motto is e pluribus unum, or out of many, one. Yet the left emphasizes the benefits of diversity. Can anyone name one country that was made up of a diverse population that has survived? After the First and Second World Wars, bureaucrats and politicians drew up maps based on geography and political influence. Made up countries such as Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia have broken up along ethnic lines, sometimes violently. A good illustration of the change in atmosphere is the controversial topic of gun control which we just discussed in the previous program with Minority Leader uh, Mike Chippendale. Over the years, we have invited advocates from organizations such as the Moms Demand Action, the Coalition Against Gun Violence, and Providence Nonviolence Issue to discuss their position on the issue. One of the founders of the coalition did come on State of the State. During the taping, he recognized me from a Judicial Committee hearing when I corrected a misstatement he made about a police officer's testimony. The tone of the interview became my adversarial at that point. Some years later, a young lady who had been named as the coalition's director of communications agreed to come on the program. A week before taping, she said the executive director told her it would not be a good idea to appear. Former Attorney General Peter Kilmartin came on the show with the municipal chief of police. We talked, among other things, about proposed gun legislation and the fact that the AG's office did not have a central file of all concealed carry permits issued in the state. This was during his campaign for a second term as AG. I met AG Kilmartin at another event a couple of days later and thanked him for coming on State of the State. He said I was the toughest interviewer I ever faced. I asked if I treated him fairly. He replied yes and agreed to come on again and debate his opponent. He never did. Members of the General Assembly who co-sponsor bills either decline my, our invitations or simply ignore them. 
My point is, the progressive left seems to want to read prepared statements or recite talking points based on emotions and symbolism rather than answer questions about their positions based on fact. Nationally, our founding document, the Constitution, is seemingly under attack as an obsolete set of rules conceived by a bunch of old white slave owners, especially the First, Second, and Fourth Amendments and the attorney-client privilege are under attack. The First Amendment guarantee of free speech is being challenged everywhere, especially on college campuses and social media. If someone is offended or triggered by something someone says, they are to be ostracized and punished. Anything said by anyone opposed to the official government line is silenced for misinformation. We hear the old saw about not being able to shout fire in a crowded theater, which I suggest does not apply if you see smoke or flames in such a venue as my late wife and I did in a small movie theater when we were dating. Anti-gun groups maintain that the right to feel safe, guaranteed nowhere in the Constitution, trumps the Second Amendment right to own and carry firearms, which is specifically provided for in the Constitution. Some judges, including a First District federal judge here in Rhode Island, endorsed this idea in relation to the newly imposed ban on large capacity magazines. The Fourth Amendment says a person's property is protected against search and seizure without a proper warrant. Yet this seems to be regularly ignored, or at least it seems that way. President Joe Biden and others have said that rights are not absolute. I wonder if that applies to Article 12, 13 that prohibits slavery or Article 19 that gives women the right to vote. Are they subject to review and revision? While our population remains stagnant ever since the Navy pulled out, the state budget continues to grow. We spend millions at the state and local level on public schools, yet our students, many of them, cannot read or do math at grade level until after 13 or more years in school. Colleges in Rhode Island and elsewhere have to offer remedial language and math courses to give these students a chance at graduating. School administrators and school committees seem to be more concerned with indoctrinating students with concepts such as social justice, critical race theory, anger management, and conflict resolution, rather than educating them in the skills necessary to survive and thrive in a modern society. Result, we are falling farther behind the rest of the world. Our colleges graduate social workers, mental health workers, and lawyers. The rest of the world is producing engineers, scientists, and medical doctors and researchers. Parents who speak out against the direction of the schools they fund and their children attend are deemed to be a threat or are, investi are investigated by the FBI. Books that are so graphic and obscene they cannot be read aloud at school committee meetings are available in elementary school libraries. When this is pointed out, those protesting are called book burners. Speaking of the FBI, does anyone, find, anyone else find it ironic that this agency is still investigating and uh, arresting people for participating in the January 6, 2021 riot? While the Secret Service, on the other hand, suspended its investigation just 11 days after cocaine was found in a locker in a secure, secure place of the White House without interviewing or testing anyone for drugs. From its first day in office, the Biden administration seems intent on implementing the Green New Deal based on the threat of global climate change. Planet Earth is believed to have been formed over 4.4 billion years ago. Does anyone believe the climate has remained the same over that period? Scientists generally believe there has been at least five ice ages, the last of which occurred 34 million years ago. I have asked people who are concerned about climate change, what causes, caused glaciers seven miles deep to invade and then recede from the very spot we are sitting in? The first Homo sapiens did not appear until two or 3,000 years ago. Clearly, the planet cooled and warmed without man-made interference. 
Those who have listened to my questions merely reply their concern is based on science. But what science are they talking about? Those of us who are skeptical about man-made climate change are called flat earthers, among other things. This is ironic because the scientific consensus once was that the earth was flat and that people would sail off the edge without uh, going over the edge to where I don't know. Nevertheless, Governor McKee has joined President Biden, his cabinet officials, and his advisors in declaring climate change as the most serious threat facing our state and country. War has been declared on fossil fuels, even clean burning natural gas without an economically feasible alternative. Rhode Island gets about 85% of its electric power from natural gas, yet the governor tells us we have to be reliant on renewable sources, solar and wind within 10 years or so. Energy Department Secretary Janet Granholm has declared that all United States military vehicles should be electric by 2030. How exactly this would be accomplished when these new vehicles are deployed in a combat zone is unclear, or whether she is also including the new Air Force One in that total, or that objective. I am familiar with a solar generating station that was con constructed about two years ago, three years ago now. There's a contract with Rhode Island Energy to purchase the electricity generated at a cost of 21.5 cents per kilowatt hour for the next 20 years. I just received the bill from Rhode Island Energy on, that shows that my charge for the electric generating, electricity generating charge is about 10.3 cents. How can any company possibly purchase its raw material for 21 and a half cents and then sell it to me for 10.3 cents? without going out of business. There has to be subsidies and cross-subsidization in order for this to happen. We have trends in this country. Um, most young people seem to be getting their news from social media and platforms such as TikTok. Even supposedly legitimate news reporters are getting their stories from Twitter or Instagram posts. Millennials and 20-somethings polled indicate a preference for socialism over capitalism. Most of them don't even know what socialism entails. They only think, think, seem to think that government will provide them a lot of stuff for free. I encourage everyone to read a book just out titled The Pledge to America by, a, by Drago Dazarian, who grew up in communist Poland when that country was a socialist state. Um, it's very chilling to read that account. And he came to this country after being repatriated from a prison for being a dissident in po communist Poland and became a Navy SEAL and has served several combat tours as, in that capacity. It's a book that young people should read before they decide they want to choose socialism over capitalism or any other form of economic uh, system. College students who are interviewed today display a dismal knowledge of our country's history or how our government works. Ask your children or grandchildren who are in high school to name the three branches of government or name their congressional representative or senator. In fact, ask some of your neighbors who their representative is in the House of Representatives and who their state senator is. You'll be surprised at the results. Um, I want to make it clear that the views that I am expressing are really my own and do not reflect those of the p staff and e executive producer of State of the State, nor do they represent the views of PEGRITV. But I think there's important things to look forward to because Rhode Island was called the lively experiment, and we are clearly in danger today of the lively experiment coming to an end. We must reverse our course, begin to become active participants in the electoral and government process, make our views known to our representatives. We are a representative republic, 
And if we don't make them known, then we are, have no one to blame but ourselves. I want to thank the executive producer of this program for allowing me to have this time to make this commentary. And I want to thank the viewers of State of the State who have watched this program since 1991. And we hope that you will continue to do so. In addition, I hope that other people from other views, political and otherwise, will come on this program and discuss with me or, or one of the other hosts their position on these issues. Thank you again for watching State of the State.